All right. So um, just a little bit of background. So I um, so I do presentations all the time, and I'm really the type of presenter um, that is like really active with folks. And so when I think about being on campus um, and being with folks, um, having conversations, I'm really big on like us all just having a conversation. And so um, I've just been thinking about like how to make that happen over Zoom and that's a little bit more difficult. Um, but I encourage you all, even before I kind of jump in, um, if at any time you have questions, um, whether you're more comfortable dropping those in the chat, um, using the raise your hand function in the chat, or, you know, just unmuting yourself and say that I'm comfortable with all of that. Um, I want this to be, I know that there's a wealth of knowledge um, that you all hold, and I'm not the overseer of knowledge in this situation. Um, but if there are things that you want to add um, or are things that you've heard and um, want to have some conversation around, I welcome you to do that. All right. And so today, um, so thank you again, Trey and Eastside uh, Change Coalition for inviting me uh, to be here today. And so, um, so much of what I do is in some ways directly related uh, to this topic. Um, and so much of what I've learned, um, definitely maybe starting um, during college has been surrounding this topic. And so I'll talk a little bit about that today. And so I'm gonna talk about um, Black Wall Street and the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Um, and so here is just a little bit about um, kind of how we'll maneuver through this conversation today. And so uh, Trey did a lot of my introduction. And so I'll talk a little bit about positionality and why um, pretty much where I am in having this conversation. Um, we'll do a little bit of shared knowledge. And so um, open, open it up to the floor. Um, just kind of talk about um, what we know. Um, we'll go through some history and then talk about like where we are now and um, why having these conversations are important. So as uh, Trey said in that uh, long bio, um, Jonathan Solomon, uh, he, him, his pronouns. Um, and so education wise, I got my bachelor's in business administration from Langston University, um, formerly known as Oklahoma's Colored Agricultural and Normal University. So it's a historically black college in Oklahoma. Um, and really a lot of that history ties in um, with the history of Tulsa. Um, got my master's degree at the University of Oklahoma in adult and higher education uh, with a student affairs emphasis. And then I am in the IRB stage finishing up uh, um, my doctoral program, uh, PhD at Indiana State University, also in higher education student affairs. And so professionally, um, the work I do here at, at WashU um, is with um, the university's oldest uh, merit-based scholarship program. And so this program originally I was created about 35 years ago to increase the number of African-American students at WashU. Um, and now it is much diverse, it's much more diverse. And so students can apply to our program. It's a merit-based uh, program that offers full tuition scholarships for students um, who have a demonstrated commitment to diversity, community service, leadership, and academic excellence. And then in terms of positionality, um, I identify as a black cisgendered man um, and so I am not a descendant of the, Tos, uh, the Greenwood District or Tulsa, Tulsa Race Massacre. And I think that's important to state um, as the topic um, and really as this history has become more popular, um, I, I wanna make sure I'm doing the work to make mention that um, my position and uh, my understanding of this work is from what has been published. Um, and I'm sure there are some blind spots and I don't want to take credit um, for work that's being done by others. And then um, I think, so you, you've heard education wise, but um, I have pretty strong Oklahoma ties. And so much of what I learned about um, Greenwood District, Little Africa, Black Wall Street um, was during college. And um, if I can reflect a little bit, I remember um, being at Langston, not knowing much about Oklahoma, um, I think all I knew at that point was a movie Twister. And so I was just like, I used to watch this movie as a kid. I was petrified of tornadoes. I don't know why I came to Oklahoma out of all places. Um, but when I arrived, I started learning about, um, you know, a lot of the history of Oklahoma and particularly uh, the rich black history being at a black institution in the state. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I remember the first time someone mentioned Black Wall Street and I was just like, what is that? Like, is that an organization or something like that? They're just like, how are you in Oklahoma? 
you don't know about Black Wall Street. And I remember I had a friend right next to me who was actually from Oklahoma City. Um, and he was just like, I don't know about Black Wall Street either. What is that? And so um, being educated about Black Wall Street by Tulsans in Oklahoma um, really kind of, um, I think that's a point of a positionality that I want to state. All right. And so originally I thought about uh, maybe um, breakout groups to have this discussion, but I think we have a smaller group. And so I want to start off um, with just some knowledge sharing. Um, if you can talk a little bit about um, what you might know about Black Wall Street, and if you don't, that's fine. Um, and then um, a little bit more in intentional, maybe what do you know about the Tulsa Race Massacre? And so if there are folks who um, maybe want to do some sharing, whether you're comfortable with dropping some things in the chat um, or unmuting yourself, you can use the raise your hand function and we can call on you, uh, whatever that may be. But I um, would love to hear from you all. Well, I'll say something. Um, I think I saw a, um, a video uh, talking about this Black Wall Street video, um, Black Wall Street, you know, and it was a time, wasn't it, when um, when uh, Black people in that area, they were um, on the economic rise, they were becoming more prosperous, right? And um, really um, making more of their mark on, in the American economic scene. And yeah, so this is when an area where you saw Black people actually um, becoming more equal, I guess, to white people in terms of economic um, prosperity, yeah. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Right, and then, I mean, just to add on to that about the Tulsa race massacre, um, again, I'm not completely familiar with the entire situation, but I believe it was instigated. There was some conflict between like a young, a young African-American man and um, a group of white people, I think. And then they, it had escalated into something that was not, there's claims that this happened and claims that that happened, but basically it led to a group of white men um, basically burning down Wall Street. Like they had uh, aircraft that was dropping um, artillery. I don't know the details exactly. Um, and they had people ride in and horses and basically just like kill any black person they could find and and burn down their businesses um and i also don't know like the numbers but i know there were a lot of deaths among women children and and men yeah thanks for sharing all right is there any anybody else that wants to comment um, i didn't learn my name is claire hi uh i didn't learn very much about either of these uh growing up uh, and it's only very recently that I've learned anything about them. Uh, and I guess to add on to both of those comments, that that's my general understanding of what happened. Uh, and I only recently, I watched two shows on HBO that actually cover the Tulsa race massacre in the show. So Watchmen and um, Lovecraft Country. And those are the only depictions I've ever seen. Um, and it's just been in the past year that I've seen it. So that's disappointing with my education, obviously, but hey, I'm here to learn, so. Absolutely, yeah, sure. Thank you. And I, I love both of those shows. And a lot of, I think a lot of my knowledge even um, maybe after college has stemmed from like watching those shows and wanting to dig a little bit deeper into like what it was that I was learning. All right, anybody else? If not, we can move on, that's fine. Uh, I'll chime in really quickly. Sorry, I can't have my camera on. I'm, I'm something weird on my mobile device today, but a lot of what folks said already is kind of what I knew, but even more than I knew. Uh, I just see, my understanding is that Black Wall Street became a threat to the control of the means of production by, you know, white uh, capitalists. And so it, you know, became a target of, of attack by right white supremacist groups and uh ultimately was massacred so i don't i don't know much more about that than you know a threat to uh white supremacy and capitalist culture absolutely 
the one little tiny thing I did actually want to add is that I, I saw that in 2020, just this year, Oklahoma has added the Tulsa massacre to their curriculum, which is really interesting. And I'd love to know more about that. If you knew anything about that, just as a teacher, I look at advocating and uh, expanding uh, what we teach in the curriculums and OSPI here in Seattle and Washington. Absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, thanks for sharing. All right, I'm going to move on. And if anybody else has anything to add, you can maybe add it to the chat. All right, let's see. Give me one second. So um, setting the stage, I think, is important. Um, and to arrive at uh, Tulsa Race Massacre, I think it's important to talk about uh, maybe some important events in Oklahoma history. And so Oklahoma became a state uh, in 1907. Um, and so before then, Oklahoma was known as Indian Territory. Um, and so uh, a lot of the history of Oklahoma stems from uh, Native people um, who occupied uh, land in the South, particularly states like Georgia, who were uh, removed from that area and um, placed um, or forced in a way um, to move to Oklahoma, which was known as Indian Territory. And so at that time, uh, many Native people, um, tribes resisted um, the movement, but the United States government uh, made it into law and, and really forced people there. And so what we do know is that at the time, there were nat Native folks who also um, participated in the slave trade. And so um, there were both Native folks and um, African Americans who were forced into these lands. And so um, Oklahoma becoming a state um, really um, derived out of a desire for expansion to the West. And so after the Civil War, uh, many folks realized uh, that the lands um, that were occupied at that point um, were becoming more and more crowded. And um, there was a desire to really get out to the West. And I think um, there was also a desire um, from natives in Oklahoma at that time, Indian Territory, to see westward expansion, uh, to see what could come from the land. And so at the time, uh, Oklahoma was known as unassigned land. Um, and uh, there was the land rush of Oklahoma that included um, the boomers and the Sooners and some of that history. And so um, while, uh, so Oklahoma was open to all folks and uh, there were many um, black Americans at that time who were maybe in the back of, back of the line in terms of the land rush, um, but also wanted to move to Oklahoma because of this promise of escaping slavery and being in a place where black people could thrive. And so one of the folks um, that's really instrumental in the growth of black Oklahoma uh, was Dr. E.P. McCabe, um, who recruited many black people to Oklahoma um, to, for those very facts, to, ex to escape slavery, to escape the, the threats um, of being lynched and some of those things and really to um, begin a life of prosperity. Um, and so Oklahoma is actually known um, for the number of black towns. And so if I go to the next slide, you'll see, one second. All right. Yeah, so one of the interesting things uh, that I learned about Oklahoma when I got there was that um, they were known as being um, a, a black state. And so the goal originally was for African-Americans to move to Oklahoma and occupy the land as a safe haven for black people in America. Um, and so there was a lot of recruitments for blacks to come to Oklahoma, um, but at the end of the day, the steam did not pick up at the rate that folks thought it would. Um, but in return, black folks did move to Oklahoma and they created these all black towns. Uh, and so you'll see some of the stars on the, um, on the state as original black towns. The ones that are in red are still here today. Um, I would say maybe the one that's towards the middle up north is Langston. And so that's where uh, the university I attended for undergrad is, Langston University. Uh, and so um, that was supposed to be the capital of the black state of Oklahoma. And so I just thought that was really interesting because um, as a black man at that time coming from California, graduated high school in Los Angeles, moving to Oklahoma, 
I just did not think that black people lived in Oklahoma. I was just like, this is not the place. <laughs> but um, come to find out there was a lot of history there. And so, um, so yeah, that was very interesting. All right. And so as it relates to Tulsa, so Tulsa at the time was coined the oil, cap the, the oil capital of the world. And so there were thousands of white folks who moved to Tulsa in hopes of making a living um, from oil jobs. And so um, Tulsa uh, was very small, um, but grew um, exponentially in a very quick time. Um, and there was just a lot of hope in terms of money. And um, what we do know is that World War I brought the loss of jobs. And so economy was hard for many folks coming back. And that built a resentment um, from white Tulsans. Um, when you think about the Greenwood district at the time that was occupied as a space where there was a lot of prosperity, um, a lot of businesses um, and um, really a really popular financial hub uh, for black Americans um, at the time. And so what that brought was um, another rise in the Ku Klux Klan. We know that the Klan um, was around at that time, um, but really this, um, this jealousy um, and not understanding how a community of black people could still be prosperous during a time where there was so much um, economic um, troubles for, for white Tulsans at that time, um, really stifled uh, racial relations in the city. And so um, what we also know is that the, because Oklahoma became a state, so when Oklahoma became a state, the number of lynchings um, increased dramatically. Um, and many of those lynchings were towards African-Americans. All right, and so as we think about um, the events that led up to the Tulsa race massacre, um, I think many of you mentioned um, there was an incident that happened that really um, made this thing happen. And so Sarah Page and Dick Rowland. So Sarah Page was a young um, Caucasian woman and Dick Rowland was a 19 year old um, African-American man. And so um, as many stories have said, um, Dick entered a elevator that Sarah was in and he tripped in the elevator um, and fell onto Sarah who screamed. And so Sarah claimed at the time that she was assaulted by Roland. Um, and uh, Dick Roland fled to the Greenwood district, which he called home after he heard her screaming. Um, and so after meeting with the police, um, after meeting with the police um, and hearing um, Sarah's story, the police officers went to the Greenwood district to pick up um, Dick the next day. And while um, all of this was happening, um, news was spreading like wildfire amongst both the white and black community in Tulsa. Um, and so a lot of the newspapers in the city um, were printing articles um, that said that Negro man needs to be nabbed um, for what he did to this white woman. And what we also know is that um, a lot of, so in terms of lynchings and and nabbings and a lot of violence towards black men at that time was surrounded around this idea of rape and um, black men raping white women. Um, and, and really, I think a lot of history talks about even if these accusations um, were not true at that time, just the idea or accu even an accusation at that point would get a black man lynched. And so, um, so yeah, so, so having an idea around a white woman being assaulted by a black man on the elevator really sparked a lot of those feelings. Um, what we do know is that the next day when Dick was brought in, um, he, his story was that he tripped and accidentally fell on Sarah and was startled after she, um, after she screamed. Um, and Sarah corroborated his story um, and said that she exaggerated at the time um, but what we also know is that Dick Rowland was not released from prison even after um, she corroborated the story. And so at that point, this, um, the news had spread like wildfire. Um, a lot of folks were finding out. There were calls to the courthouse um, saying that they were going to come and get Dick Rowland. Um, we know that he was moved to the courthouse from um, the county jail because the courthouse had cells that were on the top of the building. And so um, folks thought it was safer for him to be there. I mean, we know that he was being um, protected by police officers even as a mob approached the courthouse. So what we do know, um, more of what we know, 
Um, a lynch mob came to the courthouse with the goal of lynching Dick Rowland. And so regardless of the news that this had not actually happened the way that it did, um, folks were angry at this point. Um, and so the mob grew to over, so, so there were thousands of people outside at this point. And um, we also know that there were nearly 30 armed black men um, who met in Greenwood after receiving the news and decided that they had to do something um, to protect Dick Rowland. And so they went to the courthouse and asked, um, asked the folks that were, that were really um, in charge of protecting Dick Rowland at the time um, if they could assist. They were turned away um, and came back that night um, with a larger group of about 75 people. And when they returned that night, there were over 1,500 um, folks outside um, who, had, who were prepared to fight at that point. And so what we have is we have about 75 armed Black men, uh, many of whom are World War I vets in their Army um, outfits. And we have folks, um, over, over 1,000 who are there um, who are also angry, uh, many of whom had weapons. And so um, after the group of black men were met um, with, with this group of, of white vigilantes, um, they retreated back to the Greenwood district. And so um, what we do know at this time is that um, many, of the, uh, many of the folks um, that were a part of that lynch mob were given weapons um, from the city. They were given badges from the city um, and told to go to Greenwood. And so the result um, was really something that was um, really terrible. And so there were over 600 businesses that were ruined that night. Um, I think some of you all shared about the number, pretty much like what it looked like um, within 14 hours. And so there were airplanes uh, dropping bombs on the district. Um, there were houses and businesses being caught on fire, um, people being murdered. Um, and all, all types of stuff, just uh, lost, lo lawlessness. And so some of the, some of the um, information I think that's posted on this slide, you see 21 restaurants, 21 churches, um, the school system, law offices, 30 grocery stores, a post office, business system, two movie theaters, uh, six private planes, um, a hospital and a bank. And so um, to put this into context, just thinking about um, in 1921, an African-American community possessing those types of resources, um, I think for me was um, just mind blowing in a lot of ways, but all of those things um, were torched that night. And so um, what we know is that um, estimated 300 um, people were killed, um, over 8,000 plus were left homeless. And so when you think about um, generational wealth and a lot of those conversations now around the African-American community, thinking about those things being uh, completely torched and you having to pick up and, and figure out where you go from there. Um, and so I think the first time I learned about this massacre, I learned of it as a Tulsa race riot um, and have since then um, learned it to be the Tulsa race massacre. And so it has been called a riot historically um, because that um, pretty much helped insurance companies not have to pay back uh, premiums or give benefits to the people of Greenwood um, after the area was torched. And I think there was someone who mentioned, um, just as of recent, um, the history of this area um, and of this time and of this event um, not being um, taught in schools. And so there was a bill passed in, in 2012 um, that required Oklahoma school districts to um, include it in their high school curriculum. And so, um, as we know, you know that. I think in 2020, there are probably still some school districts in Oklahoma that are maybe just now um, deciding to have that conversation um, with folks. And I would just, I, I think in terms of 2012, that's the year I graduated from undergrad. And so just thinking about me being in college during a time where it was not required um, for folks to learn about um, this important piece of Oklahoma history is um, a little mind blowing to me as well. All right, and so as we think about where we are now, and so um, I think that the gr there's a growing national attention around the massacre. And so when you talk about shows like, so the shows Lovecraft Country and Watchmen um, have definitely sparked some conversation 
about um, you know what the Tulsa Race Massacre was. Um, as we are approaching um, the 100th anniversary, um, there's definitely some work being done um, on the ground um, through activism um, and a lot of different groups in Tulsa to shed some light on um, what happened. There is also a lawsuit against the city of uh, Tulsa from descendants of uh, people killed and descendants of survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And much of the demands um, centered in this lawsuit really talk about a fight um, against gentrification. And so folks who were descendants having the resources to be able to um, reclaim the space um, and do right by their ancestors. Um, and uh, also just uh, talks about reparations and what that means for folks um, who were displaced um, and descendants who were displaced because of this. Um, the original 18 is a term that is coined for the first 18 African Americans who were murdered um, during the Tulsa Race Massacre. And so um, as we speak, I think I just saw an article this morning that talked about the original 18. Um, and so just a little bit of history about them. Um, three days after um, the massacre, the city of Tulsa uh, received a bill from a funeral home that said, uh, we have buried 18 um, African-American people um, and you owe us $25 per person for having to bury these folks. Um, and so these folks were not, there were about five of them that were listed by name, but the rest were not. Um, and there was no information about where they were being buried. And so for many, many years, um, the descendants have really pushed the city to do work to find out where these folks are buried. Like where are these mass, mass grave sites in the city, um, really talking to survivors of this time and, and trying to learn from them where folks may have been buried. We know that many folks were um, put into the river um, and there were different grave sites throughout the city. And so as of recent, um, I think even today, there's been some conversation about one of the mass grave sites being found where the remains of these folks are. And so there are archeologists in Oklahoma who are doing work to learn more about the ways in which these folks uh, were murdered, um, whether it was by gunshot or another way, um, whether or not the funeral home may have had something to do with it, um, any of those things. And so um, I think that that speaks to, there's still so much to learn about um, the time and, and what happened. And um, there's just so many stories to be told. So um, I wanna stop here for a second and um, really just kind of put out these questions um, now that we've talked a little bit about um, the time and, and Tulsa Race Massacre and a, a couple of the details. Um, really like where does this information leave you? Like what are your thoughts currently about um, what you're learning? Uh, why is this information relevant now? And then um, I think really thinking about our times right now, just like what are your thoughts on vigilante culture? I have a question. Um, is Oklahoma State the only state that requires high schools to teach students about this massacre? That is correct. At this time, Oklahoma is the only state um, that is required um, by law. Oh, that's all, all states should require this. All, all high school kids should know this history. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind if I say something. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm currently taking, uh, sorry that my camera's not on, there's some stuff going on in the background, but I'm currently taking AP US history and I learned a little bit about this topic when like the protests first started like going on and there was like a, a huge flood of information just about like the black community and just different histories um, relating to that. And so I, I learned about this topic then. And so that when I started my school year this year, I found it like really important that I emailed my teacher and asked like what would be a part of the curriculum. And so she told me like um, that originally know that it, like she never had taught it before, but she knew about it herself. And so like, I was able to like pass on like the importance of why, like it was important that we learned some of this stuff. So I think that for me, your uh, discussion really kind of well-rounded my thinking that I can like bring to my teacher and like show her like different things that like are important to emphasize when she starts teaching it. And cause she, she did the email me back and she said that she would uh, put that in her lesson plan when we go over the 1920s. Cause it is really an important topic. And I, I just think that 
it's also really saddening for me just to kind of see like how history has been covered up to kind of just cover up the oppressed people like in society not even just like black people but just like a huge wide range of people so I guess it's just a sad thought for me but I really appreciated that lesson yeah yeah thank you so much and I think that so I think it's really encouraging to hear um like students having conversations with their their teachers about potentially teaching this topic and I think that so you think about Oklahoma and not being taught um really um, up until like today um, for many Oklahomans, I can't imagine um, folks in other states um, what their knowledge base might be um, or just their requirements in terms of teaching these types of things. Um, and so purposely, um, Black Wall Street Tulsa Race Massacre was purposely um, covered up in a lot of ways so that we wouldn't have conversations about it. Um, what, we, what we learned is that even um, a lot of the newspaper articles that were published at that time were destroyed, completely destroyed, um, even from um, like police files, um, newspaper articles that really ignited um, some of the hatred um, in people were destroyed. And so, so much of the information was destroyed. So I think I, as, as I continue to learn, I see it's not um, surprising to me that it isn't being taught, but I think that, um, you know, things are happening at this point that are really um, encouraging us to have more conversations. You know, think about like, why was it not taught? Why was this left out? And for me, I remember, so high school, I well, all through grade school, I loved history. And so to think about not knowing something that, um, not knowing about like the, the largest terrorist attack on American soil by Americans um, was really off-putting to me. So um, it's encouraging to hear conversations are happening with teachers. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I was also going to add um, to Elisa's Elisa's point. Am I saying that right, Elisa? Uh, the, like, and you just said it too. We learn. Everybody learns about like the Boston Tea Party. Everybody learns about. Um, I can't think of another like parallel example, but like there's there's history lessons that we always like without fault teach in our curriculums and there's always like a common thread of um it usually doesn't paint like the european um white person as doing something harmful to another person right maybe except for slavery like that's one thing that we have to learn about um that that really shows how how Europeans were um, acting or treating other populations. And it's just interesting how the Tulsa race massacre, like the genocide of Native Americans um, and other just like huge examples that have a huge bearing on like today and, and race relations today that are just completely left out of curriculum. And it seems like so obvious that this stuff should be included once we have conversations like this, like after we go to a decolonized class or hear about it on through a TV show or something. But like learning all this stuff in retrospect is a lot, it's helpful, but it's a lot less helpful than just like learning it when you're still like 13, 14, 15 um, and understanding like who you are and where you come from. So. I don't know. I, of course, I enjoyed this lesson very much. I am still wanting to figure out how we like include stuff like this uh, in all states as, as a requirement, you know, Absolutely. That's what the next step is. Yeah, if, if I can chime in, uh, thank you so much for the that history. Uh, I didn't the part about how this was just yet another uh, you know, massacre and destruction of not only black wealth, but black history um, that started with an accusation against a black man from a white woman. Um, it was just uh, another, you know, great example of some part of history that's been erased. And so thank you for bringing that back um, and being a part of the movement to bring it back. Um, I, it made me think a lot about how I need to teach this this year. <laughs> uh, I teach eighth grade humanities. 
so I kind of get to choose my own curriculum. And so I'll, I'm definitely going to incorporate this into a unit on uh, racial capitalism and the, well, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, sort of the depression and speaking in parallel to today and the COVID crisis and uh, always speaking in conversation with the present moment. So, so uh, that said, I would love to know a little bit more about the activism in Oklahoma to uh, with the lawsuit uh, to get reparations just to just so I can connect students to the the act the activists ultimately the people on the ground doing the work uh, because that's I always like to frame my activities and my lessons through current activism uh, so if you had that contact I'd really appreciate it absolutely and so I'll I'm gonna put my um, my email in the chat but it's also on the next slide and so. Um, as I am continuously learning, so like just framing the fact that like I am continuously learning about what's going on. Um, I have some really good friends who are like very involved in activism work in Tulsa currently. And so um, I talk to them about resources for learning, um, listen to different podcasts and also um, just different stories about like what's happening now. Um, I would definitely be willing to share those to the um, folks who are interested and so i'll drop my email and if that's something of interest to you um over this weekend or on monday um, i'll send you some 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 resources that might be helpful right and we'll also um on our instagram eastside change coalition we'll also be redistributing some of the the resources that jonathan has to share um as an fyi Right. So one of the questions that I thought um, at least might be important, and so I wanted to kind of hear people's thoughts, um, is just this, this idea of vigilante culture. And so I think about like where we are right now in America, uh, we think about the events that occurred in Wisconsin, um, and we think about um, vigilantes. Um, so folks, I think, in, so when I'm thinking about vigilantes, I'm thinking about folks um, who are taking it upon themselves um, to police their to police different communities in a way um, that can be harmful um, to the communities that occupy that space. And so when we think about Wisconsin, we think about um, vigilantes who traveled from states away um, to help police um, while um, protesters um, were protesting, you know? And so we've seen that in um, throughout history and we see that now. And so um, maybe just, um, thoughts that people might have about vigilantes? Um, is there good with, within people protecting communities or um, if you've had any experience with vigilantes yourself? Um, we'd love to hear from folks. I, I think an interesting question with that revolves around like what vigilantes are protected and what vigilantes aren't protected like if you look at the example in Wisconsin, like the people who showed up with with guns to protect property, of course, were like white young men and they were not like persecuted. They were not charged with anything. They were not punished in any way. Um, I want to guarantee you that if that was like a black group of like Black Panthers or another um, uh, group of vigilante African Americans, there would definitely be like some sort of punishment upon them. And so I I just think with whenever there is a, a vigilante group, like there's automatic like privilege in um who is is comprising that vigilante group. Uh and this is like a prime example, like a, a group of white supremacists literally burned down Wall Street and there were no repercussions. But if there was a, a vigilante of a different color, of a different creed, um, I guarantee you that would look a lot different. I can, I can speak a little bit to <clears throat> vigilante acts uh, in Seattle here. Uh, just if that's what we're, if that was the question, if we want to speak to the present moment, 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I've been pretty just involved here in Seattle uh, in a lot of the organizing and the actions. And I just kind of experienced a lot of firsthand physical attacks uh, last night, hit by a car uh, on Bike Brigade uh, <clears throat> with the Black Indigenous Coalition. It's not the first time <clears throat> that I've been hit by a car um, this, this summer. Um, so <clears throat> lots of, you know, the shooting at CHOP uh, <clears throat> in Seattle, all of that was, you know, something that I guess I witnessed and experienced this summer here. So there's, you know, such a vibrant amount of white supremacist uh, action and violence uh, happening right now, but very little reporting uh, on it. Uh, and a lot of police, uh, a, a lot of police are ultimately aiding and abetting uh, of these organizations. So we see it again today uh, and we're feeling it. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think it's, you know, it's always um, insightful and interesting to kind of hear about like what's happening in different parts of the country. Um, and so I know that, you know, uh, some of that is happening here in St. Louis. Um, I don't think at um, the same level maybe, um, but I just, I, I hope that, you know, within your activism um, that you continue, I hope there's some safety in it, you know? And I know that that's a, a lot to ask during these times because you just don't know um, what folks are gonna come with. So when you talk about vigilantes, um, what, what they're coming to do and um, what you might be um, opening it up to, you know? So I'm just really, I'm sorry to hear that, um, yeah. Also, just as like an extension of what I was saying before and in combination to Oliver, it, it feels like when the vigilantes actions are in line with the police, most of the time they can get away with it. But if there's ever like a, vigil a vigilante that's acting on behalf of like an institution or a group that's not the police, that's usually when, when they're, they're punished for that vigilante active um, action. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, Claire, um, for the comment um, as you're talking about the Proud Boys and um, the president and being told to stand back and stand um, down until, you know. So that's another example um, of vigilante, um, vigilantes, so. All right, so I am going to um, go ahead and go over. So um, I think we, we have a few minutes. Um, if there are any questions that you all might have for me or have for the group or um, anything, anything that you might just want to add to this discussion or um, any of that. But other than that, I just want to thank you all for um, sacrificing a little bit of your Saturday. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you could be doing. And thank you so much for engaging in this type of work um, to learn. And um, I hope that this is something that you might be able um, to t tell at least one more person about, you know, so we can continue to grow our knowledge. Um, and others. And thank you. I mean, we give a little virtual round of applause. I know some people out there, their camera off, but we really appreciate this um, coming to, to share education. And hopefully like to all the people who, who came today, um, like education is a, a waterfall effect. Like now that we have, have certain information, something that, um, Oliver, you mentioned that you're part of um, Morning March, I believe. Like something, one of their chants that they they always say during their marches is educate your neighborhood, educate your family, educate your friends, educate your coworkers. And, you know, education starts, starts with you reaching out for opportunities to educate yourself. And then of course, passing that on to others um, to, to keep the cycle going. So thank you also to everyone who, who took time out of the Saturday to come to come to this. Thank you so much for organizing this and thanks for the talk. Appreciate appreciate y'all doing this. And I guess my last question, I've taken up a lot of space, but uh, would be, have you gotten, have you been working or connecting with the Washington State Ethnic Studies Now group at all? Uh, they do a lot of 
uh, the work on changing and rewriting curriculum with ethnic studies uh, here in Washington and OSPI. And it'd be cool to, I don't know if that's a connection y'all know and have. Yeah, that's funny you bring that up. At the end of our decolonized class yesterday, someone had stayed afterwards to bring up that group. And she said she was working with them to change some of the curriculums um, in Washington State. So we just got that connection yesterday. We were checking out the, like their Instagram and just research, researching a little bit about what they do. Um, but we do hope to reach out to them and, and hopefully try and help them in what they're trying to do. Do you have any other information beyond that of um, contacts or like what type of work they do, Oliver? Yeah, I can give you the information uh, of the person in charge. Uh, I just kind of attend some of their meetings uh, and go to some of their trainings. Uh, but I'll, I'll shoot you, uh, I think I have your email address. I'll send you uh, Tracy, uh, Tracy Gill, uh, her email address and she's the head of the, the program. They're super accessible, a lot of youth voices, a lot of uh, like centering youth perspective and uh, just a really great group of educator activists. Sweet, thank you. Yeah. All right, that's all I have, uh, Trey, unless you wanna. Yeah, I mean, from here we have five minutes. Ending early isn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I just wanted to open up to the crowd if there's any other questions, comments, concerns, anything related to this topic or about social justice or Eastside Change Coalition in general. Uh, um, I have a question, Trey. Yeah. Um, I'm with Indivisible Eastside, and we uh, there's a group of us who are working on the school resource officer problem in our school district, basically wanting to get rid of them. Right. Is your group involved in in that kind of uh, have interest in that topic? Yeah, yeah, uh, and we do. We're actually drafting demands to remove SROs from. Um, Lake Washington and Bellevue School District right now. Another group on the east side, um, Black Lives Matter, excuse me, East Side for Black Lives is a group, yeah. another youth organization. They've done a lot of work in trying to change the SRO program. They found that there's like a lot of hoops you have to go through in order to, to remove an SRO. So they've been like hands-on deep in the policy of like, who decides where SROs come from, who writes the contracts for SROs. Um, so if you want, we can also connect you with Eastside for Black Lives as they've definitely done more work around SROs than Eastside Change Coalition. Right, I recently, um, our group connected with uh, NAACP, Seattle, King County as yeah. well. So we're, uh, we've had one meeting with them and we're going to have another meeting with them and they're gonna, I guess, help us with strategy. So we're quite excited and trying to um, put together a coalition of, of our group so that we can approach the school board and right. um, right. get something done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you shoot us the email for sure, I would love to talk more about that coalition and how we can help that. Okay. Sweet, okay. sweet. Any other questions, comments, anything? Well, hearing none, um, of course, you guys have our, our Instagram, I believe you have our email address. If there's anything else, you can reach, reach us through that. Thank you again for everyone who showed up. Thank you, Jonathan. Educate your family, educate your friends, educate your neighborhood. And with that, we can call this classroom session over. Have a great rest of your Saturday, you guys. See you all, thank you. Yup, take care. Thank you. All right.